The reason solo shuffle can feel so hard is because you need to adapt instantly to new partners, like Illidan God X over here, who has a 50% chance of ignoring everything you say. It's not like the good old days where you could grind out raiding with friends and have a good time. No, solo shuffle is like being put in a battle royale where your weapon randomly changes every few minutes. Sometimes it feels like you have a rocket launcher, other times you are given a spoon. And unfortunately, the hour of fishing you did between queues isn't going to make your life easier, but that's exactly why we made this video. As today, we're going to show you how to navigate the chaos of each round by teaching you how to adapt to new partners and test to see if your shuffle teammates truly hate playing with you. One of the big issues with navigating solo shuffle is the fact that in every single lobby you're going to be playing with up to three different DPS classes and two separate healing classes. So say you're a demon hunter and end up with an arms warrior, subtlety rogue, and fire mage in your lobby, along with discipline priest and restoration druid healers. This opens up six different potential compositions, all of which can require you to adopt very different playstyles, be that target selection, cooldown usage, defensive play, you name it. Take the composition on screen for example. Our low rated demon hunter is paired up with a beast mastery hunter and disciplined priest. Coming up against elemental shaman, frost mage, disc priest. Immediately from the very start seeing a hunter on your team means a few different things. But before we jump into it, I want to test you guys watching. Who do you think is the best target for our demon hunter to be focusing and why? Well, while we could sit here and go into excruciating levels of depth as to who the most optimal target is and why, anybody who said either the mage or shaman is correct. The key concept you need to be able to identify here is that hunters of all specs revolve around using their crowd control onto healers in order to create pressure. Getting the game started, our demon hunter wastes no time in getting straight into the action, while simultaneously our beast mastery hunter doesn't hesitate either and immediately stuns the enemy priest with his intimidation. Every single one of you guys watching should be able to identify what the hunter's next move is after his intimidation stun. Much like Blind into Sap, Dragon's Breath into Polymorph, Imprison into Sigil of Fear, all of these when used are leading crowd controls in a chain, so seeing one of these in a context like we just saw should very easily allow you to identify what's going to be coming next. But our demon hunter sees this and instead thinks to himself, this is prime real estate to start cleaving and pushing for that 99 log and as a result immediately breaks the trap. Mistakes happen though. So carrying on with the game, our DH recognizes that he's starting to get some pressure rolling into the shaman, so like any competent player, he combines this with some crowd control onto the enemy healer by using his imprison. It's quiz time. Can you identify why this was a bad imprison? Well, there are a few reasons this was bad, most crucial of which is that freezing trap and imprison share diminishing returns. It's important to note whenever you're paired up in solo shuffle with specs that rely heavily on diminishing returns. So think classes like mages with their polymorph, subtlety rogues with stuns, hunters with freezing traps, or even balanced druids with cyclones. It becomes your job in that composition to then play around these DRs with them, and the first step to do that is making sure you don't hinder their ability to do so. This imprison here will not only be very short, but also reset the priest's diminishing returns, and in turn set the hunter back on his freezing trap as well. And that's completely glossing over the other issues, like the fact that the shaman is 70% with pain suppression active. But at least after a massive hunt into pain suppression, our demon hunter makes up for his mistakes by making sure to land his sigil of fear out of the half duration in prison. Fast forwarding through the game, diminishing returns eventually drops from the enemy priest, and our demon hunter's teammate makes the most out of him being in netherwalk to safely land a trap, immediately forcing the trinket. Skipping through slightly and then pausing here, just after freezing trap, DR falls again. And we can see that our hunter has his intimidation stun and freezing trap coming back in a matter of seconds, identifying a very clear win condition. Especially considering if we play the clip a few seconds longer, we can see that the enemy priest is forced to use void shift. What does our demon hunter do though? Well, he imprisons the priest, not only putting him on diminishing returns and again hindering his teammate who is already actively pushing in for a potentially game winning trap, but also doing so for no reason. Knowing diminishing returns and not breaking your teammates crowd control are all pretty basic fundamentals and mistakes I'm sure none of you make, so let's dive deeper. Playing in the background, we've had a warrior paired up alongside a feral, and together they've rushed in, unleashed unhealable levels of damage, and are able to eventually win this game with just sheer overwhelming momentum and damage. 
But then in the next round, the same warrior finds himself paired up with a fire mage and a discipline priest. In similar fashion, he rushes in, pops avatar, recklessness, colossus smash, every cooldown he has available, and begins decimating the warlock. Hold on, we have to stop here and just all take a moment to admire his damage. I mean, come on, he's doing 50k DPS. Clearly, he's just built different. Now for a comparison, let's look at skill capped resident warrior Joe, Joe Fernandez Fernandez. We have a very similar composition and scenario. He rushes in, starts on the warlock, but this time doesn't pop any cooldowns until this moment here, where he storm bolts the warlock. Comparing both clips, our low rated warrior managed to do over 50k DPS, used every cooldown, and forced, uh, well, absolutely nothing other than a roar of sacrifice. Joe Fernandez did less overall damage than both healers, but somehow forced triggered from the healer and the warlock as well as both unending resolve and void shift. So why is that? Does Joe just not know how to do damage? As we know, Mage in general is a class that looks to land their crowd control in the form of either Polymorph or Ring of Frost, and then burst during that time. That's just how they're designed. Playing back the clip, Joe Fernandez focused on holding his damage for when his Mage landed crowd control, and then the second he sees the Polymorph responds by stunning the Warlock and bursting alongside his Mage. Our low rated warrior however just went all out from the get go, and although looked good on the damage meter, didn't play around his mage at all. And then when we see his mage in position to do a dragon's breath into polymorph and pop his combustion. Now, once our mage has landed his crowd control, our warrior has absolutely nothing but his sustained damage left to contribute. No Colossal Smash, no Storm Bolt, no Avatar, no Blade Storm, no Thunderous Roar, nothing. And they're not able to force a single cooldown despite the full polymorph. Unless you've played WoW for years at a high level, knowing how to change your playstyle in order to best fit different specs is something that doesn't come easily. Come on, there are 12 unique classes and up to 36 different specs. Luckily for you though, Skillcap.com has been working alongside some of the best players for each spec to put together a series in which we teach you how to best play alongside every spec in the game. Providing you with all the necessary information, like what diminishing returns each spec has, when and how they set up their damage and burst, how they look to survive, as well as so much more. So if you want to do yourself and your teammates a favor today, then look no further than Skillcat. In fact, we're so sure of our service that we even offer a rating gain guarantee to all of our members. As long as you use our website, we promise you will rank up. Anyway, back to the video. Jungle Cleave, RMP, Windwalker, Death Knight, Shadowplay, and even TSG. These are all very popular and timeless compositions, and even if you don't play any of the specs featured inside of one of these comps, chances are you can actually identify each spec's role inside of that composition. Take the Mage and RMP for example. In general, their role is to get crowd control onto a healer and burst during the rogue's stun. Solo Shuffle, however, introduces weird and wacky compositions like this one here. Frost Mage Devastation Evoker Discipline Priest. Much like our low rated mage, you've probably never seen this composition, let alone know how to play it. So how do you work out what your role is? To give you some added context, the enemy team is going to be training the Devastation Evoker from start to finish, leaving our low rated Frost Mage completely free for the entire game. So what do you think our Frost Mage's goals should be this game? If you don't know, that's fine, I'm going to talk you through my own thought process. I know Devastation Evokers are not the best at dealing damage when trained by double melee, or in this case, BM Hunter, and in general are not known for their high sustained damage. I also know Devastation Evokers focus around high bursts in a short time span, primarily revolving around deep breath. Finally, I know they lack crowd control, having only the stun from deep breath, and sleepwalk, with the latter being increasingly hard to land if he's the one being trained. With those takeaways and my basic knowledge of mages, I can identify that the mage's role is going to be two things. Land crowd control onto the healer as much as possible, pump out sustained damage, and try to burst on polymorphs. It's that simple. As after all, we're talking about a double caster composition, and in general, it's always up to the caster who is free to be the driving force at building pressure and creating kill opportunities, something Frost Mage is inherently very good at. Knowing what we know now, let's take a look at how well our low rated mage fulfills this role. Straight away, we see there's no urgency. The second he identifies he's not the target, he should immediately be on top of the enemy monk in between him and his DPS threatening polymorphs, but is instead immediately on the back foot peeling. What we can give him credit for is doing somewhat decent at getting out sustained damage, forcing the blur and cocoon with a glacial, but there just isn't any crowd control into the enemy healer yet. A few frost bolts, blizzards, and an offensive ice block later, we get the first polymorph of the game, but it's onto the hunter. So already, it's been over 40 seconds and we could have had two full rotations of polymorph onto the enemy mistweaver. 
At this point, you can tell the Devastation Evoker already hates playing with this mage, and takes matters into his own hands, unleashing his deep breath. It takes this to kick our mage into gear, as we eventually get a polymorph onto the healer that immediately forces Trinket Revival. Now though, instead of just pumping out more frost bolts and getting some pressure rolling for his next polymorph DR on the monk, our mage spends the time doing basically nothing. And now, with Polymorph DR's back, our mage decides to get into the action by helping burst the Demon Hunter alongside his priest's mind games and evoker's fire breath with a dragon's breath of his own. Then after a good knock out of the darkness, a couple of blizzards and a glacial on the pet. We get the second crowd control of the game onto the monk, which was actually himself walking into the priest and getting feared allowing the Devastation Evoker an opportunity to actually do some damage with his second deep breath, forcing the turtle out of the hunter. Sitting there as a viewer who understands the role our mage should have been fulfilling in this composition, and hopefully by watching this game, you can very easily identify the mistakes he's been making. He didn't threaten any crowd control, landing only a single polymorph. He didn't create any consistent pressure, instead spending the time peeling. And he most definitely wasn't the driving force in that double caster composition by setting up win conditions. Learning how other specs execute their damage or set up win conditions is helpful from an offensive standpoint, but what we've yet to touch on is healers, and trust me I can guarantee that if you're a DPS player, you've made a healer hate you. And of course if you're a healer, I can ensure that you've made a DPS player pull their hair out screaming, wondering why you didn't trinket. There are so many reasons for this, and a lot of which we've already covered inside of our Why Healers Hate Healing You video. But to start, we're going to focus on something entirely different, and that's testing your knowledge on how to play with and around certain healers. Pay close attention to this clip here. We see our evoker trinket a blind into a full hex just as his shaman gets put into a kidney with Deathmark active. We all know Deathmark is one of those cooldowns where somebody is definitely going to have to trade a defensive out. Responding to this, our evoker pops his emerald communion despite the shaman still being at 75% health. Here's the question for you. What is the first global the preservation evoker is going to press the moment this hex expires. Take a second to think about it. The answer is Cauterizing Flame. Cauterizing Flame not only removes Deathmark, every single poison, but even heals the target for a considerable amount, completely countering assassination rogues. So if you're the shaman in this situation and see two seconds left on the hex, your health at 70% and no chance at any follow-up crowd control. Why on earth would you trade out Astral Shift? Granted, not having voice communication to fall back on for cooldown trades makes it increasingly difficult to prevent overlapping defensive cooldowns, and it will always have the potential of happening, but there are steps both parties can take to reduce the risk of this happening. Step 1 is to know and understand common cooldown trades. For example, if a Disc Priest is stunned and you're low, assuming they have Pain Suppression available, chances are they're going to use it. This is one of the most opportune times. Same goes for Power Word Barrier. If the Priest is free and you're in a Spear Bastion, it's usually going to be expected for the Priest to make that trade. Step 2 is being clear and concise with your decisions. Take a Rogue's Blind. It's common knowledge that healers want to almost exclusively save and use their Trinket to break out, especially if there's a potential for a Sap in any level of damage going out. Sitting a blind just like our healer does here, despite seeing True Shot, Explosive Shot, and even Storm Keeper active, just doesn't make sense, and all decisions like these accomplish is creating potential risks of overlaps. The rogue expects the healer to trinket, the healer wants the rogue to trinket, but the rogue rightly so won't because of the risk of smoke bomb. Then all that ends up happening is that they both panic, resulting in our priest trinketing blind with two seconds left, and the rogue luckily proccing cheat death as well as using vanish and cloak to survive. Although in a standard coordinated arena setting, being greedy and making calculated decisions can sometimes pay off. Solo Shuffle is a whole different beast, very different, so try your best to be as clear, concise, and proactive as you can with your defensive cooldowns to avoid any confusion. But whether you're just starting out, coming back to the game after a long break, or even an experienced player, Solo Shuffle is a daunting experience. If you are looking for the best place to give you that confidence to queue up, look no further than SkillCap.com. Our website features hundreds of guides designed to make you not only a better and smarter player, but also a better teammate, offering a wide array of class courses which teach you how to do rank 1 level damage or healing in easy to follow videos, a library of arena commentaries where pro players break down difficult arena matchups and teach you rank 1 level strategies. And the best part? All this comes back with the guarantee that you will gain at least 400 rating while actively using our guides, so if you want to get started on your next PvP journey, check out the links below. For now though, that wraps up this video. Be sure to let us know in the comments below if you enjoyed this type of content and how you got on with the questions. As always, we want to thank you all for watching. See you soon.